<laughs> Welcome to this afternoon's panel discussion on interdisciplinary uh, biomedical research at Boston University. Uh, so the focus here really is, of course, some extraordinary work being done here. I'm really thrilled to co-moderate uh, this panel discussion with my colleague, Dean Karen Antman. Uh, I'm Ken Luchin, Dean of the College of Engineering. And today you'll hear from three uh, extraordinarily exciting uh, faculty who are doing work that are addressing uh, that is addressing very important problems using highly interdisciplinary and fascinatingly diff uh, complex approaches. Um, but of course, they are not the only three faculty at Boston University that are exploiting the interdisciplinary approach to address challenging and important problems. Uh, there's a whole cadre here that exists in this institution that, in fact, many largely of which drove the creation uh, of um, the Kilijan Center. And of course, the, all the ones that are here now are not, didn't just get here and come here in the last two weeks. Uh, it's been a long history here at BU to attract and create our success uh, in these areas because of this embracing of interdisciplinary research. Uh, speaking uh, from, from a personal ex point of view, and since it is a BU-centric session, you know, back in the early 2000s when I was chair of biomedical engineering, uh, we went, competed for and won the $14 million Whitaker Leadership Award, the only one of three institutions to get that, largely based on a highly interdisciplinary approach and vision for enhancing uh, medical uh, and clinical ap applications using an interdisciplinary approach with faculty to join BU in all departments in engineering and in medicine. Uh, we also won a translational uh, research award from the Coulter Foundation, five million award, uh, one of only nine universities to get that. And at that point, we're the only department in the country to have won both of those awards. And again, embracing an interdisciplinary and multi-college approach to, this, to these challenges. And if you fast forward, as many of you have heard, just three days ago it was announced that we are uh, we are the lead institution on one of only four $20 to $40 million National Science Foundation engineering research centers out of 200 or so institutions that applied. And what is this center? Well, it's at the nexus of uh, nanomanufacturing and nanotechnologies and uh, nanomaterials and cell and tissue engineering and regenerative medicine and optogenetics and photonics and synthetic and systems biology, all to make a manufacturable, scalable, cost-effective, clinically usable, functionalized piece of heart tissue that's personalized to the individual. So again, life science at the nexus of multiple disciplines, uh, which is very exciting. Uh, so, you know, to f finish my remarks, my opening remarks, let me just say that once again, uh, we're at the beginning. And at the beginning, let me introduce the first speaker. Uh, that will be uh, Professor Shui Han, uh, who joined Boston University back in 2010. Uh, and Shui is using optogenetics and a variety of other approaches to really uncover some of the secrets and approaches to uh, interacting with biology and physiology in, in a multi-scale sense. She's the winner of multiple uh, funding awards, including an NIH uh, Innovation Award and a PCASE Award. So let's start with Shui. Thank you, uh, everyone. So we have heard these really uh, fantastic two panels this morning, especially the second panel uh, on neuroscience. So we learned a lot about the complexity of the brain and the argument of whether uh, a brain on a dish, is it a brain or is it a piece of brain tissue whatsoever? And you learn uh, quite a bit of different kind of neurotechnology. And we realized the daunting problem of solving uh, brain disorders or just understanding the brain. So my research is really focused on neural network. So let me explain what I mean by neural network. I will give you one example. So as a mother of two small children, once in a while I get a phone call at work at BU from my kid's school. Now within that two seconds before I pick up that phone, a number of emotions, thoughts go through my mind. 
I would be worried. Something goes wrong. Something must be happening at the school. Otherwise, I'm not getting those phone calls. What's on my schedule? How can I get there? With the bus in traffic, how long can I, is it going to take me? Where is my husband? Can he get there? Right? So all these thoughts and transitions of emotions all happening so rapidly. Now, if we think about the brain, my brain is the same. It's the same type of cell, although a lot of cells. So in a cubic millimeter of human tissue, there's about one million cells. And these cells are connected by about a trillion synapses. So it depends on which cells are activated. They can form a different network. And these networks are probably transitioning from my anxious state to more relaxed. And thankfully, nothing really happened so far at school yet. Uh, so to you know, relax and your heartbeat goes up and then goes, goes down. So that's how our brain, these networks, transitions from state to state that really help us navigate our daily life. We are capable of doing that. Now, if we think about uh, brain disorders, like depression, or even Parkinson's disease, if we think from a neural network perspective, perhaps these patients are just stuck in these network states. It's undesired. They cannot transition out of that. So if we really start to think from a neural network perspective, now think about the medicine that we have been using for the past century. Now this morning we discussed all these drugs are more than 50 years old. These are chemicals. What do they do in the brain? We don't really understand. But perhaps they help transition the neural network state from one to the next. And now another second point I want to brought up, which was in depth discussed this morning, deep brain stimulation. So these are tiny electrodes targeting less than a cubic millimeter of tissue deep in the brain with electrical currents. We do not understand how deep brain stimulation works. However, we do know if you turn it on, patients recovers, like in particular Parkinson's disease has been remarkable, uh, uh, the, the effect from deep brain stimulation. When you turn it off, patients go back to the tremor and it can, uh, cannot move and so, <clears throat> and so on. So this really highlights something about the network states, the functional aspects of the neural network. The same neural network can do different things, can stuck at undesired states uh, in certain disorders. Now, <clears throat> with all the technology development over the past two, three decades, for example, the uh, fMRI machine we have in Silsi, actually this is our fMRI machine, we can actually measure brain activity in humans non-invasively and with pretty good resolution and spatial resolution and so on. And now we probably are very familiar with uh, EEG measurements of electrical signals from the brain. And this is a, uh, a, a EEG head by uh, Steve Colbert that now with more electrical engineering tools, we can really get meaningful signals from the brain non-invasively. And these are all global type of network uh, analyses of the brain. So if we really think about what we can do, can we connect individual neurons to networks and link these sort of mechanistic studies with the human observations from the clinic. So that's the, the, the focus of my lab. We are looking at developing tools and apply these tools to monitor and control neural network. So here is one example. This is a, um, we are looking into a mouse brain. Uh, through a glass window. So on the left, you can see this field of view is large imaging uh, in wide field conditions uh, with the support from the neurophotonic center here. <clears throat> so now take a zoom in from that little blue box. You can see these individual neurons, that uh, white dots. Uh, their activities goes up and down that's measured by the intensity of these fluorescent light signals. So you can see these neurons are lighting up, going down when their activity go up and down. So this, again, is a mouse that's actually behaving, and we are looking into their brains. So now, with these capabilities, we can record thousands. We can now record even hundreds of thousands of neurons simultaneously at high speed. So what can we learn from this network? Now, with this individual neurons activity, can we really derive some network principles to really understand how the brain operates? 
So now I guess that, linking that neural network, individual neurons and network behavior to what the, actually the mouse is doing. So seeing there in real time is actually what the mouse is doing, running around, and the, this mouse later on, right now is a healthy state. Later on this mouse become Parkinsonian, so we can look at different states when these network has certain features, what happens uh, at the individual neuron levels, and can we identify these features and use that as a target for next generation uh, new types of therapies for brain disorders. So I would just leave it there. I love the pictures. Uh, sir, I'm Karen Antman from the medical school and uh, we certainly are delighted with this gift to the university. So the people who actually study organizational behavior in science know that that location matters and that juxtapositioning uh, people from different disciplines actually makes a difference in productivity. Uh, we also know that uh, the real paradigm shifts in science are developed at the, at the uh, uh, positions uh, at the interstices literally between disciplines that if you're a member of the club you don't actually question the dogma of your club but by brushing up against somebody who looks at a discipline from an entirely different way you actually make the major changes in, in science because you you then realize that there actually is a question there and it's not the answer that you were given as a graduate student so I think that this is going to be an, an incredibly uh, productive investment on the uh, putting the in, interdisciplinary research in the same building uh, in, in sciences at Boston University. Uh, the speaker for this afternoon from the medical school is Daryl Cotton, known to many of you. Uh, he was born in South Africa, um, went, got his BA at uh, University of Pennsylvania and got his MD at WashU, um, and did his internal medicine residency at University of uh, Pennsylvania. He did his pulmonary and critical care uh, fellowships at Boston University and then did a postdoc with Richard Mulligan in genetics at Harvard Medical School and was recruited back to uh, uh, BU. He is a leader in stem cell biology and he co-directs our campus uh, imaging core for uh, tracking stem cells in vivo. He's um, an, a member of the U.S. International Stem Cell Bank Board and the American Society for Clinical Investigation. Uh, that is a, an organization in medicine that you get in if you're, it's called the Young Turks. Uh, there's also an organization that's the, the Pro Association of American Professors that is called the Old Farts. So <laughs> it's, I'm, I'm, I'm not kidding. Um, <laughs> He's gotten multiple teaching awards, so he is one of the uh, standard triple threats. He's a clinician, he's a researcher, and he's a, an a, a exceptional teacher. Uh, so he's gotten teaching awards. He also is a jazz musician on uh, guitar, and his wife is also uh, a physician, and they volunteer and teach in Africa and India. They have two sons. Daryl. Thank you for that nice introduction, Dean Antman. It's a pleasure to be here to uh, celebrate the opening of the new center. And uh, with the mission and values of the center in mind, I'm uh, representing the medical campus and our Center for Regenerative Medicine. I've prepared a few movies and stories of innovation, collaboration, and, and sharing much uh, in the spirit of the new uh, center opening this week. So to start with, in our Center for Regenerative Medicine, as the name implies, our goal is to regenerate organ function in, in settings of disease recovery and help our patients. And for a number of years, I'll tell you one collaborative story that we've tried to work across the city of Boston with a number of investigators trying to engineer new cells, tissues, and in this particular movie, whole entire organs. In 2010 here, we published a bio-artificial engineered lung you, that bioartificial lung is from a rodent, was transplanted into a recipient rat that woke up and breathed with the new bioartificial lung. And that lung was made with naturally occurring primary cells. And it's much more difficult to try to engineer those tissues from stem cells, which is the current focus of our work. So in the 
the past seven years since that initial publication we, we made with uh, Harold Ott, we've worked on engineering stem cells in the laboratory to try to achieve similar goals of engineering complex three-dimensional tissues or even whole organs, whole lungs for transplantation, for example. And we've been making progress in that area, as shown on one of these histological slides where you can see engineered lung tissue, but now coming from pluripotent stem cells that we make in the laboratory, either from animals or from our, our patients. This is a, show, a photo of a colony of stem cells growing in a laboratory dish, and these stem cells, called pluripotent stem cells, we've engineered from a little boy who had a devastating lung disease, causing him to be short of breath due to a mutation in a, in a gene that was very important in lung development. So these are cells that we've engineered by taking a small a sample of his skin and reprogramming them into induced pluripotent stem cells, cells that would resemble the child's cell state three and a half days after fertilization in the embryonic state. So if you can picture an embryo going down the fallopian tube, these cells have the exact same phenotype, but they're created artificially through engineering through a technology called reprogramming. And the power of these cells is that they have the potential to model the onset of this child's disease to help us understand the disease and develop new drug therapies or new uh, engineered lungs to, so we could transplant patients one day with their own lung cells engineered from, from themselves. So every cell here in this picture carries the child's entire genetic background, including the mutation responsible for the child's disease. And that disease represented on this CAT scan was very severe, and we can try to understand what led to this CAT scan appearance by using this child's cells over and over in the laboratory. Now, we've engineered similar cells from many hundreds of patients, both at Boston Medical Center and in the Framingham study, the 7,000 participants in the Framingham study that has run for more than half a century now by Boston University are represented in our stem cell bank on the medical campus. And this is the largest bank of its kind for lung, dis lung disease specific research in the world today. And I'm proud to say it's an open source reagent that's available without charge and without exclusivity. And these cells therefore have already been shared with more than 500 labs to date across the world for uh, similar types of research. This is a movie I pulled out knowing that uh, Mo Khalil would be here on the panel with me. So this is a collaboration, not only across the city, but here across the two campuses of BU, the medical and uh, the Charles River campus, collaborating to take this movie of a patient's induced pluripotent stem cells, but this cell type is made from a patient with cystic fibrosis, and our goal is in three-dimensional culture to try to nudge those cells to turn into lung cells. And the green color here represents the green fluorescent protein, the gene that encodes the protein that makes the jellyfish glow green, but now they're put into cystic fibrosis human patient stem cells. And as those cells turn into lungs, we've put the gene in a special place in the genome that colors the cells green as they decide to become lung cells. Now, um, this doesn't look much like a lung, I th I, you're probably thinking, and that is true. We can pluck those green cells out and start to build interesting reductionist models. This is a sphere in three-dimensional culture, and uh, it, the lining of the sphere represents the same type of cells you'd find in your bronchus in your lungs that you're breathing with right now. So we call this a bronchosphere. It's made in three-dimensional culture, and the attraction for this sphere, made from a patient with cystic fibrosis, is that we can start to model and understand cystic fibrosis and the individual responses of this patient's cells to drugs. So, for example, in these two movies here, I'm taking those bronchospheres, and you can immediately see that the movie on the right has these spheres that are starting to swell. So these spheres, these bronchospheres are swelling overnight because the cystic fibrosis gene, CFTR, is making fluid accumulate in the middle of the sphere and they're swelling. And on the left side are spheres that are not swelling. They're sitting there because the cystic fibrosis gene is mutated. That's what's responsible for the disease. And the measure of that disease quantitatively here is the lack of swelling. So the interesting uh, observation is that the two movies are made from the same patient cells, but the cells on the right have been gene edited to correct the genetic lesion in the gene CFTR that's responsible for disease. So this helps us introduce the theme that we live in an era now where at will the, the human genome can be edited and corrected and we can develop these interesting disease models. The interesting aspect here is that the six cells on the left can be given drugs that improve the function of this gene and the scoring of how this person's cells respond to those drugs is predictive, we think, of how the cells will respond uh, in the patient. 
So is that statement actually true or, or, or science fiction? It hasn't really been tested whether stem cells have the ability to predict how a person responds to drugs. So we tried to test that possibility in 2009 by identifying a child in New York City that might be amenable to these kind of drug predict prediction models. And what we did was take this little boy and study him in conjunction with his cardiologists in New York City. And we found the child had uh, arrhythmias in his heart that was due to a mutation in an ion channel, a sodium ion channel. And that caused this condition called long QT syndrome, which is basically an arrhythmia that would happen um, 100 times a month to this little boy and was refractory to drugs that were being tried to that day. So using the concepts I've introduced you to, we tried to do a test to see if we could predict drugs that would work in this child by taking a small sample of his skin, reprogramming that skin into stem cells that we could then turn into heart tissue or individual beating heart cells. This is a movie of the child's skin reprogrammed to stem cells and then differentiated forward into heart tissue, which is now beating. And the beating is important because those beating cells represents the child's entire genetic background, and we can measure electrical activity in those cells, which is dysfunctional because of the child's mutation. And importantly, we can test drugs on the child's cells, his own cells, to predict that one drug would have benefit or ameliorate this abnormal channel, and another drug the child happened to be on seemed to have no efficacy. So we ran a little simulation to see if stem cells could, in fact, predict a child's response to drugs, and we could see an EKG recording of this child that was improved on the drugs that were predicted to work with this in vitro model. And we started to follow this child's number of arrhythmias for the next three months. So this, this little boy had 100 shocks to keep him out of arrhythmias, 100 per month in three months before this drug regimen, and after this drug regimen following this child for three months, we recorded zero arrhythmias. So this is one example. I think uh, it's important to do statistics in large cohorts, but sometimes in those stories, we lose the story of one individual that can actually respond to a new technology. What I've tried to introduce you to in just a few minutes then, in the spirit of the new center, is the idea of innovation that can be both futuristic in terms of very distant time horizons of 25, 50, 100 year time horizons, such as building entire new transplantable organs, which is going to take a very long time, and then to be firmly planted on the ground. And thinking about the here and now, I've given you the story of precision medicine drug predictions that are already working uh, in today's uh, era. These stories are uh, proof that collaboration works, I think, both uh, across the the world, but also across the city and across our two campuses. And um, I'm pleased to announce that our sharing of that bank I introduced you to of stem cells was recognized by the American Association of Medical Colleges just last week with the 2017 awarding of the top resource sharing award to Boston University. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. And our third speaker today uh, is a, uh, also a um, professor within the biomedical engineering department and whose laboratory is in the new center, uh, as Schwerz is, uh, Mo Khalil. Uh, Mo came here, I don't know what year, about five years ago, <laughs> I don't know the exact year, but also um, to enhance our interdisciplinary approach to both synthetic and systems biology and as it integrates up to multicellular systems uh, and has done some fascinating work. Uh, he was uh, at MIT before this, um, also working in an interdisciplinary lab there, and worked in, came back here to work with Jim Collins in synthetic biology work. Uh, he is also the winner of several major awards from the NSF, a PKS Award, and a Career Award, as well as an Innovation Award. And his work has been recognized by Francis Collins, the director of NIH, uh, directly um, for some of his work to uh, develop technologies to understand and detect uh, resistant uh, bacteria uh, to antibiotics. Uh, so he is another one of our faculty members in what is the largest, if not the largest, biomedical engineering department in the country, again, built on an interdisciplinary approach. So Mo? Thank you, Ken, for that really kind introduction. And um, it's really wonderful to be here uh, serving on this panel on this sort of wonderful two days here at Boston University. I want to thank you for this opportunity. Um, I think what I'll first do is um, show you this uh, Brady Bunch picture here of the lab and just say that um, these are the intrepid students and postdocs in my lab that have signed up and embraced the idea of cross-disciplinary research. Some of them being quite crazy in that. So um, these are the ones that have become right, quite successful and adept at sort of you know, 
thinking about science and engineering across disciplines. So they're the ones to really think. So um, in the spirit of movies, I'm going to show you another one. This is a movie we often show. This is a movie of a neutrophil, an immune cell, that's actually chasing and hunting a bacteria through a maze of red blood cells. Okay? And so this cell is doing remarkable things. It's monitoring the environment. Right? It's measuring things in the environment, and in the real time, making computations. And in those computations, it's then deciding where is this bacteria, and ultimately it's going to execute a behavior, which is to engulf that bacteria. You can see it right there. Right? So we think this is just a remarkable thing. Um, and our lab is interested in cellular functions. And the traditional way of studying things like this, cell biology, molecular biology, is to observe, right? to classify, to knock things out take a protein out, knock out a gene, right? Um, and now, of course, with the advent of things like genomic technologies, we can catalog all the different kind of molecular constituents and the molecular sort of parts, if you will, that encompass these types of living systems and, and, and their behaviors, right? So we've gotten really good at cataloging. We've gotten really good at disassembling these types of systems, okay? But what we have a poor understanding of, really, is, is how you would build a system like this, how you would take constituent parts, putting them to, put them together to achieve remarkable functions like this that we envy as engineers, right? Okay, so that's really the goal, and this sort of discipline that's sort of centered around that goal is called synthetic biology, which is the discipline that we study. And if I was to give you just a one-sentence kind of d definition of synthetic biology, it's the engineering of functional cellular or biological systems from genetic parts, okay? So much like other engineers would take parts, electronic parts, things like that, assemble them into modules that could then be abstracted and assembled in you know, higher order ways into larger systems like the iPads in your pockets and the phones, et cetera. We're thinking about taking genetic parts, assembling them in new and interesting ways in cells to figure out how function emerges. Why are we doing this? Well, for really two reasons. The first is we think this offers a really unique and complementary bottom-up approach to understand how cells execute their, their, their remarkable behaviors. Right? The second is, of course, that living systems offer us a remarkable capacity to potentially solve a lot of societal problems. The idea of biology as a substrate for engineering um, is, is kind of uh, is universal to solving problems from energy to the environment to human health. Right? So what we're thinking about is reprogramming cells to do the wonderful chemistry they already do, right, to produce chemicals and products and drugs. We're also thinking about reprogramming cells to be therapeutic vehicles, right, or maybe even modulating a whole ecology of microbes in the gut or in the environment to do useful things. So what I'd like to do is just show you in three slides kind of a few of the wide-ranging projects around this umbrella um, in my lab. <clears throat> so one area is really trying to control the fundamental process of gene regulation in cells. All cells have to express genes to do the things that they do. So what we've been doing is much like, as I said, electrical engineers, we've been trying to engineer synthetic proteins into circuits that can control the expression of genes in cells. There's a number of applications for something like this. My next door neighbor in, um, in, Sil in, in the Kelishan Center is Wilson Wong, who I've, who I've sort of um, highlighted here in the slide. And his interest is in cell immunotherapy and harnessing immune cells to target and kill cancer, right? And so the technologies that my lab is developing and the control circuits that we're developing we're looking to sort of upload into immune cells and other therapeutic cells to fight cancer in, in, in more sophisticated and maybe even safer ways. My other neighbor is Doug Densmore. He's an electrical engineer who's interested in basically design automation. And together, actually, the three of us are thinking heavily about what are the analogies of computation but in biology, right? How are cells executing these computations? Okay, for a second project. So I've been telling you about trying to engineer the insides of cells in very sophisticated ways. You might know that the environment inside a cell is really crowded and complicated. 
right? And this is the environment that proteins, the things that do, the things that we, we all know, right, inside cells have to fold to carry out a function. Oftentimes that goes wrong. And cell and proteins misfold, adopt new conformations, and as a consequence of that can aggregate. Okay, we all know sort of a ha the hallmark of a lot of neurodegenerative diseases and many other diseases is protein aggregation. So that's the bad side, right? But what we're learning recently is that protein aggregation may actually also be um, a mechanism for good functions in cells, okay? Um, for instance, as I've sort of depicted here in this general cartoon, to bring new functions and phenotypes to microbes like yeast. And now we're uncovering more and more organisms for which protein aggregation may actually be a good thing. So we think of it as this precipice. Right? In some cases, it goes really bad. In some cases, it can be really beneficial and an interesting regulatory mechanism that we can exploit as engineers. But we don't know a lot about this biology, I would say, particularly at the cell biology level. And so in general, there's a lack of tools to interrogate these types of phenomena in cells. So in conjunction with um, uh, collaborators across the river at MIT, the late Sue Lindquist and others, we've been developing a number of these kind of genetic tools that's making protein aggregation in cells visible and controllable. So we can control it for the good and track it to be able to do screens and learn about what causes proteins to aggregate and what we can do to potentially thwart that. Okay. So lastly, um, we know that microbes, bacteria, are playing fundamental roles you know, in our lives, right? Um, the first picture there is just a, a cover of the CDC antibiotic resistant threats um, um, article in 2013. We know that bacteria are evolving resistance at an incredible pace. This is a global healthcare crisis. All of the, many of the drugs that we have are ineffective for many of these bacteria. And so, so we've got to solve this problem. But on the other hand, we're learning about a sort of the, the microbiome of bacteria and, and the, the, the microbiome in the gut and the environment that's playing all sorts of other important roles, including, you know, including um, 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 keeping sort of human health and, and physiology. So along those lives, my lab has been developing a number of technologies in the lab that would allow us to assemble microbial communities from scratch, as well as evolve microbes to learn about the processes of resistance and the trajectories of resistance. And what I'm showing you here is a movie actually of a, an undergraduate in the lab who's been assembling these high throughput DIY, do-it-yourself devices that are, um, that are basically culturing cells for long periods of time to construct these communities and to evolve these cells. And this has been a great project um, from a number of respects. This device has become really sort of um, exciting for many kind of researchers in the field. That map that I'm showing you there is, we basically dotted 10 labs across the country that are now have these devices. You know, so we've basically been using this as a, cent as a centralized way to share data protocols and, and do these types of studies. Um, and um, it's, it's been a fantastic project, about sort of not just microbial sciences, but also in terms of thinking about collaboration across the country and perhaps also across the world. Okay. So with that, I'll just um, uh, stop, and um, I guess no questions. I'll get back onto my panel seat here. <laughs> yeah, I'm so used to asking yeah. for questions, so thank you. Yeah, yeah. I'd, I'd like to ask the panel, uh, from a leadership perspective, how does one encourage uh, interdisciplinary research? And how does, how does a university structure itself to uh, to reward people who are actually doing it. You're all, you're all poster children, as it were, for this, or you wouldn't be on the panel. So how does a university do this better? You each get the answer. <laughs> all right, I will start. I guess uh, a lot of research we do from a pr very practical point of view is where the funding comes from. Yeah. So uh, as you probably see the very last slide, if you remember those movies that presented with thousands of neurons and uh, also from this morning, how do you analyze these data? So I'll give you one example, which 
our fantastic dean actually supported the seed funding so that enabled me to collaborate with the faculty in our electrical engineering department to use artificial neural network to analyze real neural network. So we just got started. And because of the support, we can actually get a grad student to kick off the study. I think this also echoed this morning session. You know, we have fantastic ideas cross-disciplinary, but if you go to uh, you know, uh, the government, they say, I want preliminary results. And so where do you get those? Mm -hmm. And then in order to really start this collaboration, I think these, these um, uh, seat support within the institution is in a way really critical. And I think this uh, uh, fantastic gift will definitely push forward collaborations within CLC, and I think so I heard two answers there. One was uh, rewarded with funds for, for preliminary data, but I also heard the grad student part, and I think the graduate students play the, 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 the role of going back and forth between the two labs and, and basically catalyze the collaborations. The, uh, the, other? the program that yeah. Shui talks about is specifically designed to fund cross-disciplinary collaborative Seed, seed, seed ideas. Yeah, we have seed which, funding which too, and you get you get the extra points. The grad student points. is exactly the glue you talked about. The, glue, the grad student becomes the glue, or the the kind of the 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 bee that goes back and forth and cross pollinates. Other thoughts on what the university can do? I don't know if this is a thought for the university, but I'll okay. just speak to sort of. Well, well if you were the NIH, what would you do? Yeah. Well, okay. yeah. So I mean, I'll actually speak even before sort of funding and things mm -hmm. like that. I mean, I, I'll speak on sort of some of the projects that I described. A lot of the interdisciplinary work that we've been engaged on and how it's been sort of derived has really been somewhat serendipitous, right? And so the project I described on protein aggregation was uh, a chance that I had to meet Susan Lindquist at, an, at a Howard Hughes Medical Institute meeting where. All of a sudden, you know, she mentioned this problem that we didn't have tools for doing X or Y, right? And, and I think that there's this sort of, in general, a lot of interdisciplinary science or interdisciplinary work is catalyzed by identifying the need and making sure that's channeled to the, to the right person, right? And so I think, you know, even kind of beyond mechanisms for funding or maybe even before mechanisms for funding, I think some sort of opportunities for collisions, whatever that is, right? Um, where, where conversations can happen where, you know, I, I try to keep up with literature, but it's very difficult to know what are the various needs in, 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 in the different fields. So, yeah. so I, think, I think, of course, the, of the, the new center, co the co-location is yeah. key. And I, I just to, to sort of build on that a little more, and I, and I think what I heard this morning, um, I'll also mention this, you know, uh, robust interdisciplinary, collaboration and robust interdisciplinary research is really about the people you work with. And so, you know, I highlighted a few of the, my colleagues. They're just actually buddies next door to me on the same floor. And that's, that's been big because I trust them and, and we have fun working together. And, and so I, I think that's actually a huge part of interdisciplinary. One of the speakers that, this morning said the same thing. Yeah, yeah I could expand, uh, some of, uh, is this working? Yeah, yep. some of the uh, concepts Mo's bringing up. I think the importance of common space you know, can't be underestimated. So you think if two principal investigators get together and they really think about a project and then they ask their students to collaborate, it often doesn't work, which is interesting why that happens. So what, what, hap what works unexpectedly is when you throw people together in a lunchroom that are from totally different disciplines, you, and the principal investors get out of their way or even get out of the room. <laughs> Stuff happens, the conversation, you think they're all on their iPhones, but they're not. They actually start talking about the sandwich and quickly then the project, and then, and then before you know it, there's a real collaboration happening. And those common spaces don't exist in a department. They often exist in a center. So in the spirit of this you know, week's opening of the center, you take people from different departments, and if the students are eating lunch together, good stuff's going to happen. It's inevitable. So I think that's how universities get collaborative research going. So if I can expand on this. I heard, and, just, mm -hmm. and this is not even ex remotely exhaustive, I heard th between the three of you, optics, genetics, molecular and cell biology, stem cell biology, imaging, multi-scale physiology, uh, mechanical uh, uh, forces that understand if you the transport phenomena, uh, control theory. Um, so now the question is, let's go to the, the next generation. How do you train these individuals in all of these disciplines? Do they get 27 PhDs? <laughs> do, they, uh, do they get 
is it something that they pick? What's your, your um, the question is how, how, what's your style or what do you think is the most effective style to cre create and perpetuate these interdisciplinary at the intersection of life science and engineering people? Uh, I'll just say you, you see a picture of my lab. This actually, not, my, my lab's not quite that big. Those are sort of um, significant what are you others. Are you in that? Yeah, it's still so up? There's, a, there's also, a, I think there's a three, do you see that? There's also a three-year-old in that picture. So it's, <laughs> but, um, but, but that lab is, but my lab is composed of um, people of, of lots of different backgrounds from biomedical engineering to mechanical to physics to, to molecular and cell biology. And that's, of course, by design, right? Mm -hmm. Just putting them in the same place and, and, and trying, to, to, trying to work together. What we've tried to foster is a common language. I think a lot of sort of trying to do interdisciplinary is just being able to talk about the same thing, right? And, and you know, trying to come up with a common language that everyone is on board with, right? And so, so that happens through bringing these people together through subgroup meetings, group meetings, things like that, and coming up with a language. Um, um, yeah, so, so that, I think is, that I think is really important. Then I would just say, you know, just reflecting on my personal background, you know, I studied mechanical engineering, and it, I find that like, yeah, so yeah, I, so I studied mechanical engineering. I'm doing far from things in kind of traditional mechanical engineering. Alice is laughing, right? Please. She would never hire me for mechanical engineering. <laughs> 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 right, right. She's, <laughs> she's laughing. But, but it's funny, right? We, we sort of we specialize, specialize, specialize. You get to the point of your PhD and your postdoc, and then I sort of you know, try to encourage people to kind of release a little bit, right? And, and all those things are very important in terms of kind of learning how to ask a question and, and, and solve a problem. But after that, it's really open. If you're gonna do cross it's really, really, you know, really important to sort of release, right? To kind of go in the other direction and just kind of learn kind of more broadly about, about, about science, right? What are your guys' thoughts about how do you train your grad students to, to and postdocs to embrace this fact that they have to interact with disciplines that are not their degree? So I would just echo what uh, Mo just said. You know, during the PhD, say let's start with the PhD process. During the PhD, you kind of specialize, specialize, and specialize in these a few things that you do and you put it in your thesis. You're really good at it. But then you really have to broad up, be broadened up, and then be able to understand a lot of many concepts. So very often, I, I tell my own grad students, and I said, the, the thesis you're gonna write on is a specific topic. It's very unlikely you're gonna to continue to do the same work you're doing for your thesis. So what you really trained on is not the particular technique that you know how to do so well, it's the process of learning how to learn very effectively. I think that's what a really a PhD is. You need to do a little bit of math, otherwise it will be really hard later on. But nonetheless, it's the, the, the learning to how to quickly, effectively learn and do problem solving. I think that's what. Yeah, from, from my perspective, the importance of the, 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 the leader leading by example saying, I don't know and I can't know everything and neither can you, that's critically important. So to reach to very quickly to take the students and say, we can't be experts in everything. I mean, for our story, the movie I picked that was done with Mo was to say, we need to be able to watch cells with sophisticated you know, optics and movies and so, the answer is to say, we don't know how to do that, and we're going to drag ourselves across a, a shuttle bus to your lab and look at the instrument and talk to you and explain what the question is. And that's, that's how I think the students learn that you can't know everything, and it is collaboration that's going to be the secret. I'll, I'll, just I'll add one more thing. It's, I, th I think that's a really good point. And, and, and sort of another point that I, I try to make with my lab, especially with young and early graduate students, is um, um, tell them, especially when they come in with really big, ambitious ideas that I know are just not going to work, right? There's no way. I say, that's a really good idea. Go read about it. Go explore it and try. You know, I'll give them six months, you know, to play around and see if they, and sometimes it works. But, but, but typically, I'll know that that project is never going to work, right? But that just having that confidence to ask kind of bigger questions and, 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 and be creative is really important. If you kind of shoot them down early, it's, it's not going to happen. <laughs> Can we open the, the yeah, questions right. to the audience and then continue to ask que follow-up questions of our, our group? Uh, questions from the audience? Oh, doctor. We thanked you in your absence for making this major investment. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to comment on um, 
<laughs> then you were absent, and then we thanked you. <laughs> um, you know, what I heard, um, and um, I've been thanked for the last too many days, so many times, that I'm beginning to think that I'm already very close to becoming God of the universe. But <laughs> no, but seriously, um, the input of money obviously is important, as in several areas of life. Uh, but what is, I think, mo most important to have this interdisciplinary concept uh, become like a normal concept, an everyday concept, is to develop a culture. And that's got to do with leadership. And I think the best, again, what I said this morning, uh, there are no better, no better uh, institutions which can develop this than fine educational institutions like Boston University and others like that. So um, I think that probably if I had to, as a, as a donor, if I had to make a judgment, I would say that um, to have a really great success in inter interdisciplinary uh, working together, especially for research, for problem solving. Yes, money would be probably 25%, but all the balance is people mm -hmm. and with the right culture, and that's uh, leadership and educational institutions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Rajan, I, I, I want to jump on that for a second, because you hit the word, it's culture. And, and Bob will tell you this, if you go to many other different institutions, they're far more siloed than Boston University. Yeah, S siloed. Where, where, where faculty in different departments or different schools and colleges or med school and engineering schools, they don't have a culture of encouraging, supporting, and, and, and recognizing the power of collaborative interactions. I think it's one of the reasons that we've been so successful, particularly at this, in, the, in the life sciences as an institution, because we embraced it. And I'd like to see, from your point of view, A, if you agree, and B, what obstacles still remain mm. To even make this even more successful, in general, and perhaps here at Boston University, all that does put you on our spot with the president sitting up front. <laughs> <laughs> because it's, it's so empowering. Yeah. So, so, I'm so, what are your sure thoughts he on that? I want to be uh, aware of any obstacles too. So, go ahead. What could we do better? What could we do better? Well, I mean, I mean, we, the reality is we are on we are on two campuses, right? We talk. We spend a lot of time talking about that. Um, yet, you know, the hum, human nature is to innovate and to get together. And there are people that somehow figure it out and, and join the two campuses, and there are others that can't figure it out. But it's for sure talked about extensively. And uh, um, yeah, I I wonder. Um, we've explored a number of innovative ways over the years to get people together more, but um, some of us have worked together in the panel here, so something's working, but that's uh, anything else on your minds? So. You know, one thing I noticed uh, with the new building, right, I see the food truck, and you know, very informal, relaxed environments, mm -hmm. creative ideas happen. I, I go there, wait, in front of the food truck, I see my faculty <laughs> colleagues, and then ideas just come up. You know, coffee shops. Yeah. I think these are just you know informal Is space. Any ideas food trucks or <laughs> <laughs> I haven't done enough to uh, analyze the statistics. <laughs> yeah, but I, I think these informal kind of or uh, you know uh, self. Um, clustered spaces where people just run into and collide into each other. I think that's yeah. important to have. Sure. You know, I thought maybe I could um, uh, share some ideas from my world of uh, business, which is primarily we have evolved from a construction company over the last 30 years into an engineering and project management company in the areas of energy, conventional energy, hydrocarbons, mm -hmm. uh, from the time you find them till the time you uh, deliver them to the consumer, uh, nuclear power stations, and uh, uh, other fossil fuel power stations. But that's our main, uh, main uh, business. Uh, by accident, we also found a gas field. We went into exploration up the value chain. Uh, but the reason I'm telling you all this, all my life, uh, I have only worked and I had to even, uh, and I would say for quite about two decades almost, 
force different departments to work together in a commercial enterprise mm -hmm. because we are like um, uh, uh, special operations guys. You know, ExxonMobil uh, awards us a project to go in the middle of the Sahara Desert mm -hmm. where they found a gas field. So to go in there, you build a small township, it's a four-year project, you have 10,000 people there, 20% are white collar, uh, half of that are high-tech specialist design engineers, and then you have all the way down to even little mini medical uh, clinic units. Uh, and the, the, the challenge is always the successful project management companies from the normal, and the unsuccessful is the fact there's only one thing, and that is teams of people submerging their ego and working together for the common project. So you go in there, do the project, and get out. Mm -hmm. And then you go on to the next. But, the, you know, everybody, can, everybody has the capital, big companies, small companies for their projects. Everybody has uh, good design engineers. Everybody has good construction personnel. But to make in a uh, different cultures of the world, I mean, even in the Middle East, people tend to think it's one. No. Uh, the culture in Abu Dhabi, which is uh, one hour's driving time from Dubai, is quite different. They're all Arabs, but it's quite different. Leave alone going into the middle of the Algerian desert, 1,000 kilometers from the coast, or you go down to Egypt, or you go into Iraq. It's completely different people mm -hmm. under the brand name of Arab. And then along with that, you're bringing in people from the States. You're bringing in from different parts of India, which itself are... 500 countries, in my opinion, I come from <laughs> there. And from all over the world, you're bringing from Southeast Asia, you're bringing from, and to make them work together. And that is really the key. And it's tough, especially when you have on top of that uh, people with uh, uh, a very, very high level of education to people who are only used to uh, excellent with their hands on putting steel work together, for example. So, um, the, the, we focus all the time in, with our HR department or our people, you know, with, to make people understand the, the uh, importance of uh, uh, teamwork. Mm. And it's really the culture of teamwork. And at least in my line of business, it's, it's a miracle that it happens. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, you know? yeah. Yeah. so how, do, how do we improve the culture of teamwork? And how do you guys foster it in your laboratory? Things like Good authorships point. come up, things of that nature. How do you avoid this tension versus enhancing collaboration? Yeah. Um, I, I'll try to address that. Uh, those are actually some really good remarks, yeah. by the way, and I think kind of route, I was going to just note that those are some really good remarks, and also just to echo the idea of kind of rallying around a grand challenge is a really, you know, good way to foster interdisciplinary research, and I think some of these centers in the building itself has already kind of catalyzed some ideas of kind of grand challenges that a lot of people can work towards as a team to execute as opposed to just, you know, executing my own scientific mission, so I think that's really good. Um, uh, with respect to how do you create humor, that, that's the age-old question. That, that's mm -hmm. a really well, you know, yeah, ephemeral I, and difficult yeah, you know, I, question. I, I had a, yeah. I, I had a yeah. contrast yeah. with other institutions in that. I, I visit a lot of institutions where they have virtual centers. In other words, it's not a real yeah. physical center. Yeah. And that, to my, my view, really doesn't work. So I think the unique thing here is when you build, when you invest in these common spaces and people actually physically come in, and then you have a real seminar series and real you know, neighbors that are from different departments, mm -hmm. the people really start to get selfless and work together. And, uh, and you'd be amazed when you go to different um, lab meetings, for example, if the principal investigator's talking nonstop the whole time, you can <laughs> bet money that's not a, yeah. you know, a yeah. selfless culture yeah. environment of collaboration. If the PI is you know, suppressing their voice and the people are speaking up, you know, that's a culture that's pervasive for breeding selflessness, sharing, point. working together. And I see, a, I see a lot of that here all the time, particularly in the <laughs> physical centers where <laughs> people are very collaborative, very communal. Dr. Han? Yeah, so uh, I think collaboration, especially nowadays, comparing even like a decade or two ago, if you just look at papers, in the old days, it's a single first author. Mm -hmm. Now you have multiple, multiple joint authors, and then you have multiple co-corresponding authors. So I guess this, this issue is not only like within a single institution, it's an, it's an 
uh, nationwide or probably worldwide problem. In academia, another thing that we all care about is cr credit. Who takes the credit? And how do we consider these issues? And actually, I was at this workshop in DC just talking about these interdisciplinary work. And I think this is a, a, major, cl a major climate, kind of big environment type of issue that we to need to address as we go forward. Because if we are going to encourage collaboration, how do we consider you know, even just assigning people credit? for any type of promotion, graduation, or um, you know, just along for grad student finding postdoc, for postdoc finding faculty jobs, for faculty to be promoted, for undergrads to even get to a grad school. So this is a major issue, I think, is beyond like a single institution, it's really how we go forward as everything is going interdisciplinary and how do we consider credit issues. The, the NIH actually had a conversation about that because they had a single PI and they expected somebody to be the quarterback and then they realized that nobody would actually actually collaborate under those circumstances. Mm -hmm. And so they've done the multi-PI thing. You can have three or four PIs on a grant. Mm -hmm. Everybody mm -hmm. gets separate grants, everybody gets separate credit. So. Can we use these, these strategies in order to get our, uh, our own faculty promoted and to reward them for this kind of behavior? What are, what are your thoughts? Is there, are there ways of assigning so that we know what everybody has contributed so that when it comes time for promotion, we can actually make the case? Yeah, so I, uh, to address that, I know journals now specifically mm -hmm. request each person contributed what. what? I think that's uh, just awareness in the field, and I think we are working towards that. And I, I collaborate with a lot of people, and I have a lot of co-corresponding author papers. I don't feel like I'm discredited. <laughs> so, but still, this is an issue that we are now <laughs> facing as things are going to interdisciplinary. Some, but, some yeah. journals actually put that in the, the lines at the bottom Absolutely. so that it's clear at the time of the publication of the journal what person contributed exactly. which uh, advance. What about the, uh, the, the idea that, that you must have PhD students from different disciplines, not just hmm. your home department hmm. in your laboratory? Uh, what's your sense of the BU culture in encouraging, discouraging, embracing that? Uh, and how that's responded to by the various you know, leaders of your departments and so forth. It's pretty fluid. I think the students figure it out and they find their way across yeah. campus. So it's hard to find a lab where you don't have a, that has PhD students, where you don't have a mixture across depart, mm -hmm. even across campuses, right? I think in, in both our, mm -hmm. all our labs, you, you have students from all over, don't you? I have yeah. students from biomedical engineering traditionally on the Charles River campus, but they're doing their doctoral thesis on the med campus and, and vice versa. It's very fluid. Some people are 50-50 co-mentored between PIs at both campuses. It's yeah, we, we have a lot of PhD students who have interdisciplinary um, committees. Other questions from the audience? Comments? Yes. Hi, I'm Emily. I um, graduated here in 2011 and just thinking about this relates to what we think of every day in human resources of how do we make sure that we have people who become leaders. Um, so one of the methods of thinking about this is we face the challenge of R&D leaders, not R&D people not wanting to come out to become leaders. So one of the disciplinary practices that I think that would make this program even more successful is perhaps giving them a discovery period of how they can lead as well as researchers and not being afraid to just stay behind the lab as well. So what is it that we can do at BU to make ourselves at a com competitive advantage to teach our researchers to become leaders as well? Leadership, great question, <laughs> go for it. You know, we have no training in leadership, right? I, yeah. I mean, traditionally at, in academics, you, you succeed, you get head of your own group, and then you realize what you're gonna spend 99% of your time doing, you're totally untrained for, right? So I think that culture is starting to shift where we're just starting to recognize that management, leadership, uh, that's a, a critical thing that we're missing out on. And we're starting to have workshops that teach that, mm -hmm. and they've been organized, they've been tremendously well attended. I remember a few, the Alan Alda group of how, you know, how to communicate. Weren't you one right? of our emerging leaders? We, we have the management school actually yeah. take our- Hopefully our I've emerged, but yeah. yes, this, <laughs> this is kind this of This was like the, a decade uh, ago. That's yeah. right, we're still emerging. So, so, so the emerged, message yeah. for you is there's hope, <laughs> there's a new recognition that actually the critical skills we're missing out on, and we've done a disservice to our youth, right? 
I but don't know if you've got just, any leadership training. We just training. finished I, the Emerging wonderful. Leaders Program yeah. where, the, where the management school actually takes our, our junior faculty that are identified by their chairs as being emerging leaders and they do, a leader, they do liter, literally the coursework for leadership for that group in, in a short course, like three days. So, uh, in yeah. Engineering, do you have any kind of sort of postdoc leadership training? Yeah, or? do you get the, well, do you get? I was just going to say, wh what are these programs and how do I get signed up? <laughs> <laughs> so, I, think a, I think it's a great idea. I, I echo your comment. I mean, I think that's yes, a wonderful it's... idea. You know, I graduated from Jim Collins' lab as a postdoc. I knew what I was doing very well. And then all of a sudden, I got this job where I had to do all these other things that I had no idea how to do, right? And it, Hopefully, I've gotten a it little better over It was financial ma the, management. Yep, it's, yep, it's negotiating yep. skills and conflict management, and it's yep. leadership. And, yep. and the management yep. school so, will do it. Uh, I, I would, I would say that yeah, putting okay. together more programs like this, and I, I would be, I would be signed up for that instantly. Yep. Okay, mm. me too. <laughs> <laughs> You know, when you go to NIH uh, meetings now, the old consortium meetings where, you, you know, you just have students present the abstract, and I found this and that. That's, those days are over. So now at most consortium meetings, they'll have a half-day pre-conference where just the trainees come, mm -hmm. and they'll have a, lead, a person speak about leading or managing teams or how to negotiate your job when you're done with your postdoc. So mm -hmm. I think it's a whole new era, and the more of that, the better, the better. Yeah. We'll so do, so right? given where all your researchers are going, what, looking ahead, what discipline is not currently in your lab or expertise that you wish <laughs> you see might be critical as you go forward in your respective labs? What's going to be Physics, transformatively yeah, right. important to your to your field that's emerging now? Boy. I like physicists. Yeah. You know? Okay. <laughs> I like electrical engineers. <laughs> Electrical engineering? We can no, what would you like? But I, would love I heard to from your stuff that, that and, the, and the emergence of this massive big data sort mm -hmm. of networking, you know, you're working on the brain. I would love to have a Google sitting in my lab. Google. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> on top of that, I'll say I, I would love to have more molecular cell biologists, right? Mm -hmm. As a biomedical engineer, so we have quite, you know, we have people in the lab that are quite good at that, I, but we would, we always need more of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Very interesting. Other questions from the audience? It's about 3.45. We're OK. I think we've done a wonderful time and hearing some, from spe some spectacular faculty we've got here, and uh, some of which will enhance the center physically, because that's what their lab is, uh, but research and scientifically through collaborations here and at the medical school. And uh, you know, I'm sure Dean Hamm and I want to really thank the audience and, and thank Rajan for uh, giving us an excuse to have this wonderful symposium. <laughs> I'd like to add my thanks and to the, the, the uh, panelists. And I think that in addition to talking about the science, you actually talked about the philosophy and moving it further. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.